But it's a long time since I've uh, presented a paper at the Haskell Symposium or at ICFP, because it's usually my co-authors who do the presentation, but on this occasion, none of them could make it, so you're stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> This is a collaboration with uh, the team at the University of um, Oregon. Um, and you do have their deep uh, roots in logic, in logic and stuff, which is very reassuring for me. So, here's the deal. Uh, these two functions, F1 and F2, they kind of mean the same thing. Uh, but it, they, they, they behave operationally very differently. Uh, if you call F2 on two arguments, you can slam the two arguments in registers and jump to some code and all is good, fast things happen. If you call F1 with two arguments, oh, you have to put one argument in a register, keep the second argument on the side, jump to F1, which will crank away and return a keep allocated function closure, which you then have to call passing the second argument. And so this is much slower. Okay, so given F1, why don't we just convert it into F2 by E2 expansion, after all. Uh, they mean the same thing, but they don't mean quite the same thing. And in any case, it's operationally very different. Um, now look at this. So if you've got, if H, if this little function here, if this H is a lambda x, you know, expensive, uh, lambda x do something uh, costly, and I called um, map F13 over x, is what happens? Ah. Uh, I call f1 on 3 on the very first element of x's, and I do some evaluation of the, well, I, if I may build a funk in a call by value language, I would eagerly evaluate h of x, but in a call by any language, I build a funk. So, uh, and so this h of x it will be h of 3, and then I'll map this function down the whole list, and how many times will I call h of 3 in the end? In, uh, this, in this first version. Once. Once. And here? N times, right. Asymptotically worse. Users hate it if the compiler makes their program run asymptotically slower. So GHC is very paranoid about doing this. And in any case, it's not even sound in Haskell or in a call by value language. Unusually, this talk is equally applicable to call by value languages and call by uh, need languages, but for different reasons. So in the case of call by value languages, here's a, supposing F1 is let V equal launch the missiles of X, well then, if you evaluate that eagerly, you know, world um, destruction takes place, whereas if you tuck it inside this extra lambda, um, uh, it may not if you only apply F1 to one argument rather than to two. Okay, so that's an uh, international side effect may be avoided. Here, <laughs> in a lazy language, um, uh, bottom C true is bottom, so this is Haskell C operator, and, uh, but lambda x dot bottom of x C true, this is True, right? Because we evaluate this lambda. This is all John Hughes' fault, incidentally. He insisted that we distinguish between bottom and lambda x dot bottom. It's been it's always been horrible and it's always been the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, there we are. So even for us, we cannot just un un unconditionally to time. It's not, it's actually semantically wrong, as well as being sort of operationally wrong. So uh, and even if being semantically right, it would still have been operationally wrong, so we would still have been um, uh, worried about eta, eta expansion. So Okay, so, um, however, in lots of special cases, it's easy to see that you can e to expand and hence get the fast F2 instead of the slow um, F1. Uh, well, supposing H was like this, it was a function that just took two arguments. Well, if I partially apply it to one argument, how much work would be shared if we only call H of X once? Hmm? If we call H of X, we're just going to build a little closure. No work is shared. It will happen if I said map. F1 3 over x, it's, you know, back to this um, uh, this thing. Uh, I build that little h1 of th h h of three thing, but then when I applied it to each element of the x, only then would um, h wake up and do blah. Does that make sense? Okay. So at this point, I really can e to expand f1 into f2. All right, and that's a very common case. And so GHT really tries hard to exploit this uh, this very common case. I call it here that h of x, h partially applied to only one argument, does no no serious work. It may build a closure, but it really it doesn't do any. It has a small constant amount of work. Okay, and then of course if I can expand f two, well it might be used in the same way that h is. So that might that might mean I can need to expand other functions in turn. Okay, right. So. Uh, in practice, then, what GHC does is it keeps track of this thing called arity, where the idea is that a function has arity n if applying it to fewer than n arguments and, say, seeking the result, does no serious work. There's only a small constant amount of work allocating a closure, say. 
Right? That's what hourly is supposed to be. Um, so f here has hourly two, but a partial application like g here of f to one argument that also has hourly one. Right? It doesn't do any serious work either. So hourly doesn't necessarily mean the lambda is sort of physically visible. It may just, it, it means uh, the thing at the top, not necessarily that the lambda is a manifest. Okay. So. Um, uh, and when in anything to do with DOT you see partial application, what it means is a function of arity n partially applied to fewer than n arguments. Right? That's what they mean. Okay, so this is all super important to the optimizations that, G that GHC does. But it's a sort of, um, and indeed GHC goes to some trouble to analyze uh, uh, what the arities of a function are. So sometimes it's not obvious. Here f has at least arity 1, but let's see. Mm. Maybe it has RT2. Well, this could we e to expand? Could we push this lambda y out here? What do you think? Uh, it means that if I did, that would mean when I applied it a second time, I would evaluate I would evaluate x's each time. But maybe we don't count that as serious work because um, the first time I evaluate it's a thunk, right? The first time I evaluate it, it'll memorize it, and so then we just have to look at it after that. What about this guy? F prime. Oh, is that serious work? That looks like, oh, that looks a bit like that H thing. So what hourty is F? Oh, that's the one we're working on. So if F had hourty 2, this wouldn't be doing serious work, so F could have hourty 2. See the point? Mm -hmm. Okay, so GAT has a little very, very simple-minded analyzer, which, which will, in fact, eat to expand this F in particular. This turns out, this kind of thing, you may think this is bizarre, it's a very important special case that happens in things like when you define fold L, in ter define fold L in terms of fold R, you get cases like this. Moreover, we might do some analyses that are to do with the usage of F. So here, I've got F bound with maybe no lambdas at all, but it's always called applied to two arguments, never partially applied. Well, in that case, it's also safe to eat to expand F. And we might get some lambdas at the top, good things might happen. So it might be to do with the definition, or it might be to do with the usage. So there's all manner of stuff going on to try to um, expand the But it's, <coughs> the trouble is that it's a sort of informal, squishy notion. Sort of, you know, you, you, you sort of, if you really want to say, what does it mean to say it doesn't do serious work? Uh, can we throw a few PhD students at it to try to do this? <laughs> anyway, it is a bit squishy, right? So, and more of a, because it's not sort of embodied in the type system in any way, it's possible that a transformation might reduce hourty or sort of lose hourty information. We'd never know, right? So it's a sort of piece of metadata that hangs on the syntax tree. And that always gives me sort of, you know, keeps me awake at night when I'm lying awake and I'm worrying about it's global warming and hourty, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, and it doesn't work at all at higher order. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here's map. Now, inside map, there's a call to this functional argument, f. Now, at runtime, what's going to happen? That f is going to be a pointer to Matthias, right here. This is Matthias, right? Function closure, living in the heap. But another call to map, it might be Andre. And another call to map, it might be Noah. OK, so there are lots of different functions that might appear. And they each might have different free variables. And they might be a thunk also. They might not have been, they might have been evaluated to, um, uh, to Matthias yet. Um, but even if it is, so it might be a thumb, got to check for that. Even if it is evaluated, you'll look at this function and say, oh, it's a pointer to, and, and then the first word of this function closure is a pointer to a statically allocated info table, which contains the code for the function, but also its parity. That is, how many arguments does this code expect? Because this code expects two arguments in registers. Now, here it's only applied to one <coughs> argument. What to do? Well, this particular function, applied to one argument, does nothing because this guy expects another. So we have to build, keep allocate a partial application node, which is what's going to be built as the, you know, that's, the, that's this result. But if it was a, if the arity was one, then we would have to pass the argument to the register and judge that. And if the arity was zero, then we'd have to evaluate the thumb. See, there's lots of runtime dispatch going on. Do you get the idea? That, and, 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 knowing, and, and we don't know anything about the arity of f. In, 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 in this kind of case, we might see, at a call of f, we might see the definition side. Here, we cannot see the definition side, right? Because it's lambda bound. Make sense? So, all, this, is, this is all, this is the, the problem we want to, to solve. So, when I say that doesn't work at all at higher order, knowing about how it is, there's no better data at higher order. Um, and the last thing is, this, this sort of squishy thing is very different to what we do with, you know, with types, we're with good with types. Uh, they are guaranteed to preserve, lint checks them, and so forth. And even strictness is a semantic property, which which transformation should preserve, but now it is this squishy nature.
Okay, so that's the, st the problem statement. Um, how are we doing? I lost, lost chance of a few, but yeah. I'm, uh, okay, so the key idea of this paper is terribly simple. Let's encode the outy of the function in its type. So let's invent a new sort of arrow. Twiddly arrow. <laughs> Not the same twiddly arrow that Trongor told you about yesterday. Oh no. <laughs> this is another sort of arrow. Um, but, and so the idea is in twiddly arrow, it, this is going to be a function of arrow t2, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and so in order to support this, I'm going to have a new, a new kind of function arrow and a new kind of lambda to go with it. So this new kind of lambda it, you know, is the intro form for this, um, uh, this arrow. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, the key thing about this arrow is that you can do unconditional e2 expansion. We say that once again. This arrow, you can do unconditional e2 expansion. If e has type int twiddly int twiddly int, then you can e2 expand it like this. Always. No side conditions. <laughs> right? And as I've remarked, this is not true of an ordinary straight arrow. Right? This is what the wiggliness does you. And moreover, um, you, since you can do this, we will do this unconditionally uh, this eta expansion. We'll do it unconditionally. We, we don't need to do it while we're optimizing, but before we start execution, before we feed it to the code generator, we are going to do this for every sub-expression that has such a type, right? We'll, we'll aggressively eta expand it. What that means is, is that I, if, if after I've done this aggressive eta expansion, if I have a function, that, if I have a variable bound to such a thing, I know that it will be a pointer to a heap allocated thing, yes, but not a thunk. It really will be Matthias. Matthias, Matthias, Matthias. Matthias. It really will be Matthias. And moreover, he really will have arity too. And I really can put two arguments in registers and jump to him without asking him any questions. Like, I know that he's going to be here. This is very like the difference between a variant in Haskell today is a, you know, is, a, is represented by a pointer to something that might be a thunk. I must evaluate it and do all that. But if, if, if y has that array hash in it, then this is known to this has got an unlifted pointer. It's pointing directly to an evaluated array. No questions asked, it's going to be there. So it's very, very like that. It's like an unlifted function. Um, and it's not going to be a thunk either. Does that make sense? That's the intuition I want you to have in your head. So that's a very good, good thing for a higher order course, right? So in a, a higher order call, if I had a function map prime here, which took an a twiddly b argument, well then, I would know at this point that f is bound to a function that takes exactly one argument. I don't need to do any one-time dispatch. I will just say, you know, f, here's the argument in register one, off you go. Are you with me? So it works very, this story, if it works out, which it does, read the paper, it works, it deals very nicely with higher order stuff. But the problem is, what about, um, I mean, nobody wants to write new copies of map, right? And say, what shall I call map or map prime? And shall I, well, do I use twiddly arrows or ordinary arrows? So our general plan is, the programmer typically will only use straight arrows. The compiler will introduce the wiggliness, like this. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you exactly how. But this is a bit like the, the programmer only uses int. But int is implemented using the unboxed int hash, and the compiler library code may use int hashes, and the compiler internally uses int hashes. And performance obsessed programmers, put your hand up if you're a performance obsessed Haskell programmer. Yes, like about a third of the people in this room, these guys you know, know about this kind of stuff. But the rest of you don't need to worry about the wickedness. So I'm going to show you how. Um, here is map, our original map, written using a straight arrow. Now here's a transformation we can make, a kind of worker wrapper transformation, which you've probably heard of that before. GHC does a lot of this. So, um, so here's map prime, written with a wiggly uh, um, A. So this one, we know we can compile and run efficiently. Um, but map is going to be a call to map prime. And what's this? Oh, this is like a little impedance matcher here, with a twiddly lambda that makes, therefore, something of type, uh, you know, a twiddly b, um, and that calls the, um, uh, you know, this, so this is an expensive call to this f, because this is a straight arrow f, right, in a higher order place. So this call is expensive, but this one is really cheap. So have we gained anything? Well, yes, we have, because this guy, we inline at every call site, like, uh, like so. So here is a, um, here is a particular call of the original map, if we will have, and, and often when you pass, the thing you pass the map is, well, it's a function, right? Map, lambda, p, something. So, might, so then we just inline that prime, we get lambda twiddly, that's this lambda twiddly here, 
and then we get the function you passed applied, and now you do to do a beta reduction, and you get this. And of course, that's exactly what you want—an hour to one function, you know, that, and born in, in that way. There's no impedance matching left. Does that make sense? It's very similar to the way that worker wrapper usually works. We try to move work to the call site, where, and then it all sort of disappears. But if there's anything left, I mean, there may be some impedance matching left, and in that case, you're you're stuck with it. Uh, can you? I've lost track of time. You have. Uh... Okay, good. That's fine. Great. Okay, so um, so th this is the basic idea. Encode out here the type. Use your fast calls. Use worker wrapper to uh, mediate them. Allow performance obsessed programmers to use Twiddly Arrow directly if they wish to. Um, for example, in a data structure, you might say data t is you know muck t of a Twiddly Arrow b, right? Because if you put a straight arrow, you can't do worker wrapper there. So uh, just as you sometimes put unboxed. Um, uh, integers inside data structures. You might put unboxed functions inside data structures. Okay. Now, I hope that... To, uh, put your hand up if you've been thinking, what about this? Very good. Okay, so you'll get extra biscuits for tea. Um, <laughs> because uh, how could I say it has hour T2 if there was a polymorphic R R A at the end here, right? What happens if that is instantiated with a twiddly arrow? Well, then, would it suddenly have hour T3? Put your hand up if you understand the problem now. Okay, very good. Oh, right, so, that, so what are we to do? Ah, uh, huh, I know. Let's not allow that. <laughs> 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 so we already have the idea that, some, that a polymorphic type variable, a quantified type variable, cannot be instantiated by int hash or by float hash. Because those are, you know, unlifted types of variable size. You know, you can't pass to a function that's expecting a pointer into the heap. You shouldn't pass it a double precision float. It's just not expecting it. Its calling convention is, is wrong, right? So if you think of this as being like a double precision float, it, it, then so don't instantiate A, don't instantiate this A with a wiggly thing. So what does that mean? We're going to use the kind system. We're going to make uh, the, the, the wiggly arrow... Uh, it, it's kind, we'll say, that my, the A wiggly arrow B is, isn't, a, um, uh, isn't an ordinary box lifted type, it's a box unlifted type. Uh, and, and we can't instantiate a type verbal there. I'll show you very quickly type rules for how to do that. But the, the point I'm wanting to make here is we already have this idea, right? This is not new. So uh, what, what tends to be happening in GHT is we find we want to add something new and we find at least a good chunk of the infrastructure is there already, as it were, it comes for free, right? Which always means already paid for. But nevertheless, whenever somebody says they're giving you something for free, they always mean you paid for it already. But in this case, we have, and so it's, um, uh, we need to take advantage of it. Now, um, uh, but one wonders, could we do a bit better than this? All right, so remember this levity polymorphism paper, which we said maybe we could do a bit better than just saying you can't instantiate uh, a variable with these guys. We thought maybe we can. And so maybe you can. What would it take? So would it be possible to... Um, so let's see. So uh, nowadays it is possible to have a function f who, that, can you, that you can instantiate with a type variable that ranges over type of unlifted rep. That means the, uh, it can be instantiated with types like array hash that are pointers to unlifted things. Um, in the heap. And so one might wonder, could you have a um, type of fun rep 2, meaning A abstracts over the types of arity 2 functions? So I think we probably could. And before long, we'll want to make that 2 into something you can quantify over. So we will have arity polymorphism to join levity polymorphism and matchability polymorphism and kind polymorphism and linearity polymorphism. Uh, <laughs> what's one more? Once you've got to 3, then you do it. Back to already paid for. But this is not in the paper. This is there's just some arm waving at the end of the paper about this, but I do think there's something like this would be necessary to close the loop. Okay. Um, but I think what, what is in the paper, that is without this polymorphism, just say we don't allow it, is still enough to get really quite a long way. Okay, so what what is in the paper? So in the paper we give a little lambda calculus with this extra um, let's see, with lambda lambda twiddle. Um, that's the, that's the uh, twiddly lambda and uh, twiddly arrows here. Um, in fact, in the paper, the, um, we, there's a twiddly big lambda over, over types as well. Um, in, in Haskell, since, uh, since, big, um, since big lambda is unconditionally e2 expandable in, in Haskell, because we don't, we don't let you seek on a big lambda, I'm not sure this part is, will be necessary in Haskell, but it, was, it fitted the paper very nicely. 
fantastic. Um, but the point I want you to know here is that in a, in a type application, when we apply a polymorphic function to a type, we insist that the argument type has kind V, right? So V for, for value type. So this is, um, uh, this is the thing that insists, let's see, and then we have a little kind system. So this paper says a very, very modest kind system that says, well, ordinary arrows and ordinary, um, uh, uh, this thing doesn't even have data types, have, have type some uh, V, but twiddly arrows have kind E. Right? And that's just how we can keep them separate. And this fits right into, you know, this is a very tiny fragment, but it fits right into GHC's existing fragment. Richard is making a very unpleasant face. Which means, so, you can, all right, so a thunk is being evaluated here somewhere. Um, now, uh, so here is, so this is, this is uh, so the paper contains a language, a type system. It contains an equational theory, right, that says uh, this is how you can reason about, you, this is, these are, as it were, valid transformations you can make on programs. And look, you see, here is a, here is unconditional eta expansion on, um, or uh, unconditional eta in either direction for uh, twiddly arrow, uh, for twiddly arrow, well, for twiddly lambdas, I should say, for, well, not about twiddly lambdas, but not for ordinary lambdas. Um, and then just ordinary old uh, beta expansion. Okay. Uh, then there's also an operational semantics. So this, so this is a, a sort of um, uh, uh, a, uh, an equational theory that says when you can transform one term into another. But it's also I also feel more reassured if we have something that's very like an abstract machine, so I can really see multi-arity function application taking place. Something that's morally equivalent to put the arguments in the register and jump. Well, I want something that's close enough to that that I can see it happening. And this this is a little operational semantics for call by value language. And then we, oh, and but by the way, the important thing here is this multi-arity application. That's this, you know, uh, um, uh, uncoded call uh, that happens. And then, uh, but we also do the same thing for a uh, call by need language. So this is where it sort of links more directly with Haskell with a sort of launch free style um, uh, operational semantics. Haven't yet got to a non-deterministic clairvoyant one, um, but you know, hey, hey right, right, maybe we should. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, Jennifer for that. It's a cool, cool paper. Um, so anyway, that's, that's in the paper. All right. Um, last little piece before I wrap up um, is a very obvious question about this is, hey, Simon, didn't you and Max Bollenbroke write a paper a long time ago called Types of Calling Conventions, which exactly had uncoded multi arity functions as part of it? And we did. Um, and then the idea was, and this is not an idea that was new to our paper, incidentally, then. It's been, this has been in the literature for a long time. It's simply to uncode coed functions into, well, uncoed ones uh, like this. So you take a function that goes int to int to int, and maybe you uncode it to a function that takes um, an int paired with an int, perhaps an, you know, an unboxed pair, so appear uh, that uh, they are definitely passed together. You don't want to heap allocate this argument or anything like that. But um, we'll pass them together, and... Um, uh, right, and maybe, maybe all is good. Now we've done everything, haven't we? Um, but in fact, it's really awkward when you get to um, polymorphism. Because here we've got, you know, an A, a list of A, and a floor B. So if you try to tuple up those arguments, now you're going to have some kind of dependent product. Um, and uh, that is not in GHC's core language today. Now maybe you say, maybe it should be. And doubtless, by the time Richard has worked his wicked ways, it will be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm not completely sure uh, that, that um, well, the best I can say is that the, the, the stuff in this paper is a way that fits with the way things that GHC are today. It's an alternative data point than this more conventional one. And I think we need to do a little bit of sort of thinking and boiling, which is one reason that it's so welcome to be able to present this paper here, about how the, you know, how the two might compare with each other. Uh, but one thing this doesn't do incidentally is that a high order, you know, function like this, it's an ordinary straight arrow, it really might be a function. So this business about saying I can pass something that I know it's a function of arity too, that is not going to happen um, so well. So, so. Alright, so this is my last slide, just, uh, uh, just, just some I think that the, um, the, we, we can find a way to use types to robustly express arity in a way that was, has been very, really rather squishy up to now. It fits very nicely with Haskell's existing, or GHC's existing architecture. But unboxed and unlifted types and that kind system that separates things, the existing approaches to polymorphism and work, the worker app approach. Um, and something that I have not mentioned, but it's beyond my paper, is that there's very strong roots here with um, 
uh, logic and in particular polarity and call by push value and you should talk to Zeno and Paul Downing about those things but I always feel more comfortable if I feel that somewhere below the, the, the stuff we're doing in the implementation is rooted in, in, you know, in logic that is not just an arbitrary concoction there's something solid under there um, it sort of has to be this way and that's what Zeno would say and Paul would say and that's what I just want thank you Okay, so we have a bunch of questions on Slido and also in the audience. Uh, the top question on Slido is uh, actually about the types or calling conventions paper. Carter, did he sufficiently answer your question? I mean, we still, I still think telescopes are the right answer, but that's exactly that yeah, sounds yeah, like the right. So, so then you have to specify, you have to specify the telescope story. Yeah. And, and do its operational semantics and figure out how it would fit in. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm up for that. I don't. I'm happy to talk about it's not a slam. I think it's not a slam dunk by the way yet. Uh. <coughs> okay, let's take a question from the audience. Um, thanks for that talk. So. Uh, I'm thinking about the example you have with the map, where map takes a straight arrow, but uh, you split it up into a worker and a wrapper, uh -huh. and so the worker uses a squiggly arrow. And I'm, uh, I'm a little bit worried about this example, because I mean, you showed that it works great if we provide a lambda as an argument to map, uh, because then we can sort of just eliminate things and, and happy, happy. But if we, if we can't do that, it seems like we're worse off. And uh, because we've now added this sort of squiggly lambda, uh, so we're applying things twice now. Uh, first to the squiggly lambda, and then to the actual function that we wanted to call. So, and I didn't expect you to present this. I expect you to present something else, namely a way to sort of force or unpack a straight arrow so that we can pick up or pick the uh, squiggly arrow that's living underneath the actual sort of function so that we can sort of somehow pattern match on it, get it out, and then always apply it. Is there, have you thought about some kind of construction that would allow some well, such? Well, so perhaps you mean that, that a function like, let's say you said map double, right? So double as, let's say double as part int arrow int. You just said map double, right? Oh, that double has that arrow, you know, straight arrow. So if you, so now what would happen if we played this game is that we'll end up with map prime of lambda twiddly double x but now now this call to double x this is not a high order call we know what double is the existing compiler technology knows that double takes exactly one argument so everything that is there already will say you know when when this function lambda twiddly x double x gets called just you know jump to the code for double um, and uh, but so there is a little impedance matching shim uh, and I haven't thought about whether we could get rid of that tiny shim, but it's, but it, but it's not. There's no runtime dispatch involved. Right. Um, so we're we're better off, but maybe there's still room for improvement. Uh, right. Yeah. There could be room for still more. Yeah. Okay. So we have a couple more questions about map. The map example actually from Slido. Uh, so first of all, uh, why is map evaluating the first argument of cons at all? It shouldn't evaluate the arguments. Sounds like the question is uh, basically, have we unintentionally made map strict? No. And the second one Why? is. Uh, where, where, where have we made map strict? I think. Where have we evaluated the first argument? No, no. First of all, the argument is being evaluated here. Right? So, so we're not evaluating f here. We are constructing a value here that is passed, you know, a pointer to an honest to goodness value. It is indeed passed the map prime, right? But it was built here. f, if f was a thunk, it is as yet unevaluated, right? It's inside that lambda, um, and it will only get evaluated when we call it here. Does that make sense? To me, yeah. How about everybody else? So, so the, the other question about map is uh, from uh, Gergo Erdi. Uh, in you changed maps. Um, uh, first parameter to uh, to use the squiggly arrow. Uh, yeah. Why are the other arrows not squiggly arrows as well? Would that make sense? So maybe the question is, on what basis do you do this worker wrapper? Right. So you have to, so, and, and that is, I mean, it's like when Stricker said, that's exactly how do you work a wrapper. So, so this transformation is not entirely mechanical. Yes, you want to say, look, there's this higher order call to this particular argument. 
yeah, so it's a, you know, it's, it's not just saying every hour and turn it squiggly. You kind of look at your functional arguments and how they're called. And I've not, I've not systematized that, that step yet, that calculation step. Sorry, if I can just follow up. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But I guess what I mean is that how you Yes, yes, so you could, you could indeed, you could make these, you could perfectly well make these arrows squiggly, actually, yeah, you, you could, uh, yeah. it would be perfectly fine too. But is that what inferred? Um, you could, I mean, I don't think it would make much difference either way. Um, the point is that there's the, 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 if the, uh, if the program starts off with straight arrows, you're then going to transform it to a program that has some squiggly arrows and hope that, it, you know, that, it, that it's more efficient. Now, question of exactly which straight arrows you make wiggly and how, how you do the impedance matching is then, well, that's a choice of the optimizer, and I don't have any sort of cast iron story about how to do that. Okay, I know there are a lot of extra questions, but we are out of time, so let's uh, thank Simon again. And <laughs>